The conflict is coming where it will be primarily machine on machine. We have robots battling it out to, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat on the ground. It's certainly a possibility. Today's gamers are tomorrow's robot warriors. One of my most vivid memories as a foreign correspondent was standing here when Iraqi missiles were coming in from outer space, crashing into Tel Aviv. American Patriot missiles during that Gulf War were firing back, trying to intercept the Iraqi rockets. It was an unprecedented technological event at the time. And during my many years as a foreign correspondent and covering many wars in Europe and the Middle East, I've seen how technology plays an important role. It's been that way throughout history. When the Spaniards conquered South America, it was because they had gunpowder. In World War I, the machine gun made a big difference. And in World War II, the atom bomb created the new superpowers. In the 21st century, the big factor will be robots. Whichever military has the most sophisticated robots and the most sophisticated humans operating those robots will be the superpowers of tomorrow. Kingsboro, Massachusetts, just off the Merrimack River. Officer Tim Murray from Boston's Logan Airport's bomb squad is returning a faulty robotic arm for repairs. This is forward, this opens up. Brian Hart's Black Eye Robotics built this land shark to neutralize car and suicide bombs. It blasts suspected explosives with powerful jets of heavy water to destroy detonators. It was Logan Airport where two terror teams had boarded flights that destroyed the World Trade Center on 9-11. This bomb squad never wants a repeat. The Landshark robot is one of their weapons. Could you just show us what broke? Hart's son, Private First Class John Hart, plays a big part in this robotic development. He was killed in Iraq in 2003. John was just 20 years old. For Private Hart's father, it was a life-altering event. When 9-11 happened, John was a senior in high school and the, he was in ROTC, and they all enlisted. So I realize it's becoming ancient history, but for us, it's a very real thing. And soldiers in his uh, age category, um, they experience these issues every day, and uh, we feel that um, perhaps more of the nation's attention should be focused on solutions that, that can help them. It, for us, it, it was a real and living thing. And Richard and I and our other business partners here decided to make uh, a, a, a difference. So Hart abandoned his career in health management software, and he and his brother Richard started Please Black Eye Robotics. Now, all of the weight's not on the motor shaft. Right. With $3 million from the U.S. Department of Defense. Their Landshock robot yeah. detects Definitely. and disables improvised explosive devices, IEDs. And we still got a place up here. Right. These explosives have been the number one killer of coalition soldiers in Afghanistan. Go! Hart wants Go. to spare other families his suffering. It changes you at a, at a very deep level, and uh, you come out with a, a sense of empathy for people and for families that are in these situations who are approaching them. An IED is buried for a detection test. Hart's Landshark scans roads ahead of military patrols. It searches for common IED detonators like a cell phone and warns soldiers away. Several of Hart's robots are dedicated to soldiers killed in action. Men and women whom Hart believes could have been saved by robotic detection. He hopes the Landshark becomes standard equipment in infantry units in war theaters around the globe. There's no reason 
Lance Corporals or PFCs should go down roads that aren't inspected, go through door frames that have insurgents behind them. Those um, events can be prevented with low cost, reasonably uh, accessible technology. We've got skin in the game, family skin. You've got friends that are, um, whose lives depend on this type of product and, and this is important to us. The Boston area has become a hub for military robotic development. iRobot is another Boston company that makes IED clearing robots. 3,000 of its latest pack bots have been deployed in Afghanistan and Iraq. Soldiers operate the robots remotely, seeing through video glasses what the robot is registering. iRobot technicians are perfecting the PackBot's ability to detect, inspect, remove, and dispose of IEDs. Joe Dyer is the president of iRobot and a retired Navy Vice Admiral. There is no doubt that there are many, many American sons and daughters that are coming home safe and whole because of our robots. The simple reason is that it puts distance uh, between bomb disposal operators and the bomb. Today, the operator stays still in harm's way, but at a much more safe distance than was the case in the old way of doing business. For some of the operators, the robots seem to take on a life of their own. This is all that's left of Scooby. After disarming numerous IEDs in Iraq, it was destroyed in action. Big burly uh, sergeant comes into the depot uh, with the robot in his arms, tears coming down his cheeks, and he asks the technician to fix the robot. They look at it and say, we don't think we can fix your robot, but we'll give you another one. He says, you don't understand. I want Scooby. Robots that can remove explosives from soldiers pass are reducing the number of wounded. Inevitably though, some soldiers will be harmed in battle. Boston's Vecna Corporation is developing the Bear. It's the most powerful humanoid robot in the world and will serve as a mechanical combat medic, hauling the wounded out of harm's way. A wounded soldier caught in the middle of a gun battle or under threat from a sniper. It's a common scenario. The Bear goes out to save him. The soldier is taken out of the line of fire. Armor-plated robots can withstand bullets that would kill a combat medic. This revolutionary counterweapon was invented by engineer Dan Theobald. You have to have a robot that's small and agile enough to get there. Now once it gets there, you have to have a robot that's strong enough to actually grab that person and get them out of harm's way as quickly as possible. Um, so you need a lot of agility, strength and speed and um, this robot is really the first robot in the world to combine those three. To be an innovator, you really have to be willing to try things that other people aren't willing to try. You have to be willing to ask that question, why not? And you can tell what you care about by how you spend your shower time in terms of what you're thinking about when you're in the shower. Um, and you know, for, for myself and for our engineers, our shower time is probably spent the vast majority of it thinking about how can we solve that problem with the robot. And that's the thing, you want your brain working on these problems because they're hard problems. And if you're not passionate about it, if it's not who you are, and you're not going to create uh, anything new. Peter W. Singer is a robotic warfare expert who researches future trends in warfare. In World War I, the machine gun made a difference. In World War II is the atom bomb. Do you see the robot as a plot point in the 21st century warfare? Every so often in history, there's a technology that comes along that changes the rules of the game. It's a technology like the printing press, or gunpowder, or the steam engine, or the atomic bomb. And these technologies are determined uh, not by only the capabilities they offer, but the questions they force you to ask. Questions about what's possible that you never imagined was possible before. Questions about what's proper, issues of right and wrong that you never had to wrestle with before. And we are seeing the same thing play out today with robotics. Obviously, they're offering science fiction-like capabilities. And so I think robotics is, is proving to be of that same level. The big question now is whether robots will go on the offensive.
Researchers around the world are developing a new generation of unmanned weaponry. The United States and Israel are two major players and exporters of military robotics. Do you think it's inevitable that these robots one day will become offensive warriors? I think it's inevitable that we'll have offensive robots simply because we already do. Now, how far will that go? A long way, says Joe Dyer. His company, iRobot, has produced one of the more prominent offensive infantry robots in the military. Fire in the hole, fire in the hole, fire in the hole. This is the warrior. On the offensive front line, soldiers take grave risks in confronting the enemy. Robots like the warrior will lead the advance. And that means less exposure to enemy fire for human soldiers. Road clear, proceed forward. We're on this side of, uh, uh, of the battlefield. The bad guys are on the other side, and we need to get from where we are to where they are. Now, that's never a trivial task, but in this case, it's especially challenging. It's challenging because they've placed landmines to protect their position. And to get to them, we've got to get through the landmine field. What we did with Warrior was to equip the robot with this piece of equipment such that the robot could go alone into harm's way, clear a path where we can follow. Sophisticated robots are also taking on more offensive roles in the Israeli military, primarily because this army has a relatively small fighting force. In this training exercise, a special forces team is simulating a coordinated entry into a building. There may be gunmen or booby traps waiting for them. In the past, they would have shot their way in, but now they throw in this iDrive robot. The robot scans for deadly tripwires that could detonate hidden explosives. Moving from room to room, the robot's multi-cameras search they expose a threat. The force moves in knowing exactly where the danger is. Casualties are minimized. Robots like these are built for today's soldiers who grew up in the digital age. Today's teenagers can literally put their head in the game. They're a participant in the virtual world. My generation still looks like that as a guy sitting in front of a screen with a controller. That's an important difference. And today's gamers are tomorrow's robot warriors. What do you see the role of the robot in an infantry unit? We're talking about the introduction of, of robots where you can actually assign a mission where you can say to the robot, breach the door, and the robot will have the capability to carry out that mission, much as your battle buddy would in humankind. 50% of military casualties occur within 100 yards of the enemy at the point of initial contact. Robots like the bear will probably become the frontline soldier exposed to that enhanced risk. The robot can break down the door, doesn't have to knock, um, and uh, go in there and assess the situation, move debris out of the way. If someone starts shooting at the robot, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not um, nearly as dangerous as if somebody's shooting at a human. The U.S. military has spent $5 million on developing this robot. So we've got um, a human-like robot arms that have many of the degrees of freedom that a human has, but the robot's able to lift 500 pounds. It could pick up an egg or a light bulb without breaking it, but at the same time, lift up a 300-pound object with, a, with an iron grip. The robotic option gives you the possibility of non-lethal action. How does your robot save soldiers' lives? 
The robot absolutely would have more options than a human being, and this is because the robot's life is not at stake. When a soldier is confronted in an uncertain situation, it's kill or be killed. With a robot, the risk of human life is much lower. Therefore, the robot would have more option of using non-lethal means to subdue the enemy than a human combatant might. The Israelis have moved robotic infantry to another stage. Armed unmanned robotic vehicles like the Guardium are patrolling Israel's borders with Lebanon and Gaza. The robots and non-infantry units are exposed to hostile rocket and gunfire. Infantry robots can also move with the forces from above. This is an HAV, a hovering air vehicle, produced by Israel Aeronautics Industries. It can deliver uh, ammunition, it can deliver water, it can deliver batteries to soldiers in the, in the battlefield. And in the desert mountains surrounding Albuquerque, New Mexico, Honeywell is testing a different HAV, the Tarantula Hawk robot. It's a hovering air vehicle being used in Iraq by U.S. infantry. The T-Hawk is less than two feet long and can fit into a soldier's backpack. The control stick is simple to use. Like the Israeli HAV, the Tarantula or T-Hawk uses a revolutionary technology to fly. The system actually flies not by thrust coming out the back end or the, the bottom of the aircraft, but it actually flies because of the air being sucked into the duct. Uh, that suction action actually causes lift. There's a region of, of low pressure, if you will, above the aircraft, and that low pressure is causing the aircraft to be pulled into the air rather than pushed into the air. Honeywell engineers came up with the unusual approach in what they called their war room. Floating in the skies, the tarantula gives a bird's eye view of narrow alleyways, exposing a hidden sniper or an ambush in waiting. We sat down and brainstormed how can you make a, hover in, a hovering system safe? Well, one idea was tie a whole bunch of balloons to it. Balloons are safe, right? Uh, another idea was let's make it work like uh, a big vacuum cleaner where it's sucking air and, and blowing air out the back end and that'll make it fly. Uh, another idea, well, well, let's just wrap a big shroud uh, around the rotor, uh, and that will make it safe. It's free-form thinking to get the creative juices flowing and that brings a lot of energy. I really believe an innovator does have to be a, a, a kid at, at heart, uh, a kid who likes to think outside the box, think of putting things together in ways that you have not before. See, it's kind of like a game of hide and seek. With robots taking on more combat roles, has the fighter pilot become obsolete? Welcome to Robotic Fighter Planes. Just as robotic infantry is rewriting ground warfare strategy, unmanned air vehicles, UAVs, or drones are revolutionizing air warfare. American drones like the Predator, Reaper, and Global Hawk have been attacking militants in Afghanistan and Pakistan. During the Gaza War in 2009, Israeli Heron drones hunted down threats and provided reconnaissance during fighting with Hamas forces. Far from the front, Israeli drone pilots were seeking out Hamas soldiers from a secret command and control center. The powerful onboard cameras captured images of IEDs being planted from miles away. The drone cameras lock onto the target. Militants run for cover. Children follow. The pilot holds back and waits. Not sensing the far-off drone, a militant armed with a rocket moves into view. The target is destroyed. 
Lieutenant Colonel Dan is a reserve drone pilot. We cannot show his face because of Israeli military security. I live in a small city just by Tel Aviv, and I can start my day uh, in the morning, come to my operational squadron, take off with a, with a drone, with a UAV, fly over to an enemy territory, do a mission for, for a few hours, and then come back and finish my day and go back home. A former combat pilot with a long history of ducking anti-aircraft missiles, Dan believes the drone has extracted the pilot from the battlefield. If I can do it myself, it will be much, much more difficult to take the decision to do it, and it will be much more dangerous for me. Dan now spends most of his time designing, improving, and creating better drone aircraft. He works for Israel Aeronautic Industries, IAI, one of the biggest exporters of unmanned aircraft in the world. IAI sells drones to five NATO armies which have been fighting in Afghanistan. Canada has rented the Heron drone and it has performed scouting duty for Canadian troops serving in Afghanistan. The Heron drone is especially effective because of its detection devices. One of the most penetrating image systems is the SAR, the Synthetic Aperture Radar. The radar sends signals towards a location and translates the signals into a detailed image. It can see through fog, mist, day or night. Avi Safati is one of the SAR's innovators. This is a SAR image of a field in the Golan Heights taken from 90 kilometers away on a cloudy night. This is the Golan Heights, by the way. And here in the center of this image, there are some uh, irrigation sprinklers. Imagine that you can see these small objects in the dark, this is, for me, a magic. Israel's Controp makes a DSP-1 camera. The drone can spot missiles, threats and hideouts from a distance of many kilometers. The key problem is to keep the image stable, focused and clear. The technology mimics how humans use their necks and eyes. We've got the neck which is, you moves uh, right, left, up, down and the eyes which do the same movement. But when we in a motion, the eyes do the very precise stabilization to give us uh, our brain to see a stabilized image. It's that stabilization that allows pilot operators like Lieutenant Colonel Dan to spot snipers and threats planting roadside charges. Israel recently unveiled its latest UAV, the Heron TP. It is fundamentally an unmanned bomber capable of reaching Iran. The drone has a wingspan of a Boeing 737. It can stay airborne for more than 20 hours and fly at an altitude of 45,000 feet. The pilot focuses on the target and the plane flies according to his point of view. He points out the target and the plane modifies its flight to keep it in the crosshairs. The Heron is programmed to return to base by itself if it loses contact with its handler. Shimon Sarid is a drone developer. To be a great innovator means that you must have a great out-of-the-box idea and you must also have the courage and the energy to push it out of the box. Sarid says he's constantly trying to bring out the creative child in his designers, many of whom are passionate model airplane enthusiasts. They have a hobby, a strong hobby of building and flying model aircraft. And uh, naturally this kind of people are moving into the UAV business because for them, a UAV is an advanced model aircraft to play with. And some of them are highly, highly rated around the world in their model aircraft specialty uh, in uh, international competitions. So we have many people here that their hobby and jobs are combined. And I think that's the win-win situation. Okay. We don't have to wait until somebody will uh, have operational need for, the, for it. Our experience show that if you have a good idea, you just implement it into your product, and somebody down the road and very soon will find the operational need how to use it. The U.S. Navy's creative idea is a robotic fighter jet capable of landing on an aircraft carrier, the X-47B. It will be able to execute maneuvers at high G-forces, which a human pilot could not withstand. Robotic fighter bombers is the future.
The question remains whether it means the end of the pilot and the manned fighter plane. Lieutenant Colonel Dan served in the cockpit and in the drone command center. He says the pilot is passé and finished. I think the days of the uh, macho fighter pilots are numbered. I'm sure that the future is in the drones uh, for, the, for most of the combat missions. But Joe Dyer of iRobot is a former U.S. Navy test fighter pilot, and he disagrees. I think there always will be pilots, but pilots are going to be um, commanders of a mixed force of manned and unmanned systems. A hundred years from now, uh, pilots will be uh, in cockpits, uh, I think, on special missions where intuition is required, uh, where there is uh, a requirement for uh, special political considerations. Will it be for motor skills? No, I don't think so. With advances in remote control killing, how will this affect the ethics and laws of warfare? While drone pilots argue that their safe distance from the target enables them to make better decisions, some robotic designers fear it could also make it easier to squeeze the trigger. One of the risks is that if we send in a robot, you can see a scenario where it might be much easier to take human life when we're not risking our own. How are the decisions going to be made about who you kill and who you don't kill? It's much easier for me to send a robot in to take somebody out because I'm not having to risk anything myself. So it doesn't have to be as important to do it anymore. When you're not looking into the eyes of the other human being, you know, perhaps there's a risk of not taking that life as, not valuing that life as much. But sometimes not looking the enemy in the eyes can save, not take away lives. If a ground force were to come across these abandoned buildings in a war, they would probably shoot first and ask questions later. Fearing an ambush, they would not take chances. When reconnaissance robots move ahead of the force, they could spot frightened civilians who have fled the fighting and their homes hiding in the ruins. Robots discovering hiding civilians would save many lives in battle. In wars, there are always ethical dilemmas. Robots have created new predicaments. American administrations once criticized this deadly Israeli strategy known as targeted assassinations. During the Israeli-Hamas wars in Gaza, drones have been locking onto wanted Islamic fighters traveling in moving cars. Missiles are fired from coordinating helicopters and fighter planes. They destroy the targets with devastating accuracy. Faced with similar challenges in Pakistan and Afghanistan, drone pilots have been killing Taliban commanders at remote hideouts. In both cases, there is collateral damage, civilians killed and wounded. In any war, innocent civilians die. Israeli drone pilots like Captain Omer contend that 21st century technology ensures those unintended consequences are kept to a minimum. There were dozens of uh, occasions where we were on a, on a terrorist, we were just tracking him and waiting for the right time uh, to, to act. And at the last second, we just stopped uh, any fire because we saw him getting into a school. From, let's say, approximately 30,000 feet, I can define between a man and a char to make sure that I'm bringing the right target uh, in the mission. But there are many examples where Israeli and American drone pilots misread the drone's video image. They rely on satellite technology to communicate with the plane. That means when a drone pilot in the western United States locks onto a target in Afghanistan, the image is at least two seconds old, and that could lead to unintended civilians being killed. The impact of the predator uh, is changing everything from um, 
uh, how we um, carry out counterinsurgency campaigns to questions of leadership. What is it like to lead one of these squadrons? It's very different than leading you know, an F-15 squadron to the individual experience of war, what it means to go to war. You have people who go to war every day without leaving Nevada. You have questions of law that are being raised by this. Uh, really, you know, can the Geneva Conventions keep up with this 21st century technology? Uniformed soldiers are legally protected in unintentional killings, but it is estimated that American CIA intelligence agents have carried out over 140 drone assassination attacks in Pakistan. The most attention. Right Scott Horton is a legal expert on armed conflict control. and is a contributing editor to so Harper's are, Magazine. Are these uh, robotic innovations uh, being controlled and managed? by uniform military or not. Um, I think the law is pretty clear. It really requires that they be placed under uniform military control. It seems that a number of people, especially in the intelligence community, just assume that the old rules were there for the old kind of warfare. This is a new technology and a new technique. We just don't need to worry about these uh, uh, law of armed conflict rules, so they ignore them. Um, that's a terrible mistake. Drones are operated by humans, and consequently human values are expected to determine whether lives will be taken in battle. What are the ethical considerations when we look at robots that mechanically can take a life? The philosophy of our company and of most folks within the Department of Defense is that we'll always need a man in the loop, that if you're going to take, uh, if you're going to take a life, if you're going to uh, enter that area of, uh, of ethical decision-making, then there needs to be a man in the loop. They would use this phrase, man will always be in the loop, and it was, they used it all the time, and it was almost like a catechism. And yet, when you tore it apart, actually we were not living up to that catechism. The definition of what our role in the loop is is changing. So for example, if you're in Iraq or Afghanistan, there's a system called the CRAM, Counter Rocket Artillery Mortar System. It's basically an automated machine gun that shoots down incoming rockets and artillery fire. Things are moving so fast that the human reaction when you've got a rocket coming at you is basically you can get to mid curse word. Oh crap, and that's about it. So the system responds. Now, we're in the loop. We can turn it on, we can turn it off, we can veto what it does, but in that 0.4 seconds, we're not doing that. To answer to that vulnerability, Israel's Rafael Corporation has invented the Protector, an unmanned robotic naval warship. The boat is armed with sophisticated cameras and Typhoon weapon systems. With no one on board, it's like a ghost ship. It's controlled from a command center kilometers away. And it's capable of speeds and maneuvers no sailor would have the stomach for. Noam is one of its designers. It actually enables you to do almost all of the functions of a patrol boat that you would do on a manned patrol boat without having the humans out at sea. During Israel's conflict with Lebanon in 2006, four sailors were killed when an Iranian rocket hit their SAR-5 gunship. The incident prompted Noam to push forward with his design for a vessel that would be unmanned. My son is a combat soldier, and I, I need to relate to that when, when we develop systems like this that enable us to uh, remove our, our, our loved ones from the threats and enable them to operate these systems uh, remotely without being close to the threats. The protector could be helpful when larger naval ships have to engage smaller, more agile naval combatants. It could have saved lives on the USS Cole. In 2000, suicide bombers armed with explosives attacked the US Navy destroyer from a small speedboat off the coast of Yemen. The blast ripped a gaping hole into the hull. 17 soldiers were killed. Al-Qaeda claimed responsibility for the attack. And American unmanned naval ships are in development as well. We look at things like the new U.S. Navy littoral combat ship will arrive on the coast of a bad guy country before anyone ever goes ashore. 
or before it even positions, it will have launched UUVs, unmanned underwater vehicles, to clear minefields and to gain safe access. It will launch UAVs to get God's view of the beach and the bad guys. You'll have the up close and personal view via ground robots. You'll have much better situational awareness than ever before thanks to unmanned systems. It's an unprecedented war of robots on the attack, operated by soldiers far from the front line. For American and international jurists like Scott Horton, that is a growing problem for the laws of war. For instance, drone operators uh, were recently chastised uh, in an internal investigation by the Department of Defense uh, because they misassessed over a long period of time information that was coming back uh, from a predator drone that was in its surveillance mode. They saw threats, they saw weaponry which were not in fact present and that led them to take uh, a fatal decision to use lethal fo force that uh, killed a large number of innocent civilians. Drone pilots disagree. The UAV operator is not preoccupied with the dangers facing a fighter pilot flying over enemy territory. Because you're flying and performing the mission with less pressure and you're not afraid on your own lives, uh, own life, but what leads you is the responsibility for the lives that are now in the combat zone uh, that make sure that you will bring the right result in the right time uh, with the minimum uninvolved citizens being uh, hurt. I don't think we're headed towards Terminator world anytime soon, but really we are seeing a greater use of robotics and really what's playing out is trying to figure out what roles are appropriate for humans and what roles are appropriate for the machines and how can you team them together in the most effective manner. Wait till it gets ever more smarter, ever more autonomous, then it's really gonna be revolutionary. And that revolution is taking place right now with unprecedented technological breakthroughs. What about the ethical and legal issues when it comes to robotic warfare? Is the drone good or bad? Do you support the robot or are you against the robot? And um, I think that's uh, a little bit like, like asking, are you for the airplane or against the airplane? Are you for the computer? Are you against the computer? Um, are you for the automobile or against the automobile? And I mentioned those examples because those are the ones that people say we're at with robotics right now uh, in terms of its historic parallels. You know, Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft, says that we're where we, we're with robotics right now where we were with the computer around 1980. The second Guardian UGV was sent out on perimeter patrol to protect our force. Integrating air, sea, and land robots is the next big challenge for military innovators. Israel's Genius Corporation designed the Guardium Armed Robotic Patrol Vehicle. This simulation demonstrates robotic integration, but also raises ethical dilemmas. The Guardium robot scouts a town for potential threats. Gunfire strikes the Guardium. The robot signals a drone. But from the safety of the control room, the operator cannot be sure who else may be in that building. The drone directs a missile straight to the target that would wipe out the threat, but it could also kill innocent civilians. The Israelis use naval robotics, they use air robotics, they use tank robotics. Are we seeing more robots and less infantry in the future? Right now, with really the kind of the first generation, the Model T Ford version of this technology, Wait till it gets ever more smarter, ever more autonomous, then it's really going to be revolutionary. And those technological revolutions are taking place in secluded development labs in places like the University of Maryland. Such cutting-edge projects are funded by the American military. Okay, I'm going to raise the vehicle up. Dr. Paul Samuels is changing the way wars could be fought. Going down. He's flying a neuroquad. Samuels operates the drone with his brain. It is a spy drone prototype and there are no controls. Going up. Armed with a camera, the Neuroquad will act as a scout. So when I concentrate, it creates a certain brain wave that allows me to make the vehicle go up. When I relax, it creates a different brain wave that allows the vehicle to go down. 
So far, Samuels has created four mind control navigation commands. Going down. That could revolutionize how we operate fighter planes, ships, tanks, vehicles, and ultimately robotic infantry. Any computerized instruments. Dr. Sean Humbert leads the project. He believes reconnaissance commandos operating neuroquads with their minds will become a formidable spying force. The idea would be to have these things as small as possible. In that sense, they'd be as stealthy as possible. Right? So you want to be able to send several of these out in the environment and uh, uh, not have them be picked up by, say, the, the people you're trying to uh, target and uh, tag and hunt. Dr. Humbert is miniaturizing these neuroquad scouts to less than a half an ounce in weight. And the idea is not to have uh, soldiers sort of fiddling around with joysticks and stuff like that, um, but rather if we could interpret brain waves uh, to maneuver these vehicles, that'd be a significant benefit, right? So these smart helmets would be monitoring brain waves and can be translated into maneuverability in these small autonomous robotic platforms. Humbert says, freed the soldiers' hands from remote instruments, add thought control, and the future fighter could simultaneously see ahead, move forward, and fight. Humbert's team is also developing insect-like robotic spies. The scientists are closely monitoring bird and insect flight. They contend the hummingbird, for example, possesses maneuverability far superior to any aircraft created by humankind. A flapping wing vehicle, just like an insect, just like a hummingbird, requires very, very small muscle movements to be able to achieve uh, very strong maneuvers, very quick, very rapid maneuvers. So our expectation is that by going to a flapping wing configuration, we'll be able to exceed any maneuverability that's possible with helicopters. They are also closely monitoring the worker bee to expose hidden aerodynamic secrets useful for miniature drones that may ultimately look and act like insects. Even seeds are viewed as a source for new spy innovations. This is a robo seed. It flies and glides like a maple seed. Armed with cameras and sensors, the goal is to miniaturize it to the size of a true maple seed. All right, so the concept here would be to take several of these, release them in an urban environment, have them fly around and map uh, the different buildings and so forth, then uh, transmit that information back to, say, a base station uh, where soldiers could then uh, map out the environment. At Boston's iRobot, even jellyfish have become a model for 21st century spies. If you think about a, a, a jellyfish uh, that can change shape and that can uh, advance with a very different form of locomotion than we're used to in today's robots, you'll start to get a feel for the utility of, of Kimbot, Jambot. Also, a robot to be able to slide under a door or to slide through small orifices. The Israelis are also turning to nature for new generations of robotic spies. This is the snake. It moves just like a real one. It can slither under walls through crevices and move undetected in natural settings, spying on the enemy. Where do you see the armies of the future? Will there be a big race to have offensive robots? Robots are going to reduce the number of people required uh, in the services. They're going to reduce further the casualties. And they're going to be an extension of national policy. But they're not going to be a panacea. And there's not going to be just robot wars. Robots attacking from the air. Robots that will lead infantry. Robots that will command ships. All of them operated by a new soldier, a sort of geek commando, not a macho fighter. And will that soldier be directing the war possibly with mind control commands? With conventional armies quickly becoming as old fashioned as the bow and arrow, will the powerful militaries of tomorrow be those with the most sophisticated and most powerful robots? We will surely find out very soon.